Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a special podcast program of the Institute for National Security Studies today, uh, dedicated to the Holocaust Memorial Day, which is taking place today in Israel, today and tomorrow. And today I have a very special privilege uh, to host as a speaker to the special program, Mr. Martin Schellenberg. Uh, Martin Schellenberg uh, will, will be uh, my partner for discussion for, for today. And uh, I'd like to introduce him, first of all, uh, to our viewers and to our listeners. Um, Martin Schellenberg is head of the educational department of the Memorial and Museum of Sachsenhausen. He worked as a researcher in several institutions like the Memorial of Bergen Belsen and the House of the Wannsee Conference in Berlin. He studied history, philosophy, and theater studies in Berlin and in Jerusalem and researched about concentration camp history and the Israel perception of the Shoah in film. And among many important institutions, he also uh, had the privilege to work also in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Uh, I could tell a lot more about you, Martin Schellenberg, and about your work. Uh, uh, and I am really honored and privileged to have you and to host you in this very special program. So thank you very, very much and welcome, Martin. Thank you for the nice introduction. <laughs> Um, I, uh, you know, I would like, since this is a very special program of, of the podcast, I, I would uh, like to dedicate, you know, we're, we're discussing Holocaust memory and the, how, to, how to form memory after 1945, how to, how to form Holocaust memory um, in Israel, in Europe, in Germany. I thought that it would be appropriate and right to, um, to start maybe from one of the most important educators um, of the 20th century. And I refer here, of course, to, to the wonderful Janusz Korczak. Janusz Korczak, um, an educator, physician, philosopher, writer, uh, and, and most of all, a great inspiration for many generations that came after him, uh, was murdered in Treblinka uh, uh, in 1942. Uh, but he was able to uh, do a lot before. And uh, he, you know, he wrote in his books uh, about the role of the educator and the role of education. And also the role of children and youth. And he, you know, in one of his books, he was quoted saying that there are no children, there are only human beings. Mm -hmm. And a child is able to connect and understand just like an adult, it only misses the life experience of the adult. And Kolchak actually aspired to create a society in which children and youth will be in constant dialogue, constant dialogue with their peers and will develop their worldviews in a way that will prepare them to the world. So the idea was to create a dialogue with the child, with, uh, the, youth, with the youth of his time. And uh, you know, he said also that repair, repairing the world means to repair our education. And I thought, you know, uh, yeah, the role of education. What would be better to start with, if not, if not with Janusz Korczak, especially on, on the day of the memorial, um, you know, the, comm the commemoration day of the Shoah and Holocaust remembrance. Martin, what is the role of, it, of the educator in your view? What is, what is the message of the educator? And how, what should be the message of the educator today in Germany? I think we have uh, several uh, things to achieve if we are talking about teaching the history of National Socialism and the Holocaust, uh, which are, uh, on the one hand, we have to try to uh, approach um, the emotional level um, in the sense that not we don't want to overwhelm the people and, and, uh, and make them feel bad or guilty or anything, but we want them to develop empathy. Um, because one uh, basic element for uh, for learning from the past is to see the other um, outside of yourself and uh, to mm -hmm. develop some kind of uh, empathy towards other human beings and uh, and that is part uh, of uh, trying to approach the history of something that is over 75 years happened over 75 years ago so there's not there's in general not even anymore the generational link in most families that uh, people have someone who lived at that time. It's a history of the past that we need to uh, 
try to approach uh, the uh, the perspective, not only the emotions, but also the um, the life and the decisions and uh, the thinking of the people at that time. So, so that is one of our our aims. At the same time, uh, we want to uh, make people think about uh, uh, political questions. We want them to learn something out of this history. But uh, but there we are in a dilemma because we don't want them to to just adopt our way of interpreting it and learning from it. So I cannot say you come to the memorial, one and a half hours we do historical learning and half an hour you take my message home and uh, you will be uh, a good Democrat or uh, you will believe in human rights. No, we need, to, uh, we need to make a basis for that. And they need to come to their own conclusions and maybe their conclusions will be different than the conclusions that I drew uh, a while ago and they are drew, drawing today so so everybody uh, needs to develop their own thinking and and especially if we're talking about memorial sites many people are coming to the memorials for for two hours maybe for a seminar day um, ideally they would come for several days or would come back but uh, most people just come for a short visit so uh, what we can do is uh, basically uh, give some inspiration of thinking maybe disturb some of their um, preconceptions that are wrong and maybe we can give them some inspiration where they can continue researching, asking questions, reading um, or maybe looking at things in a different way. So that is part of uh, our work mainly to, to, uh, to give inspirations and maybe um, disturb. But also um, one of the messages that uh, we have is that uh, memorial sites are not a place where you go and feel inconvenient. Go there. Find out yourself. We are there to help you. That is our message. I, I thank you very much for this answer. And you mentioned you mentioned the gap sometimes between the teachers and, and the students that they come with to, to the memorial site. And I, I, I really want to ask you also about the term of working with the past. Yeah, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Mm -hmm. Did the past pass? How, how, much, how much is it felt in Germany? How much is, the, is the, the past felt in Germany? Or how much is it felt also in the classroom? What do you think? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I ask this because, uh, you know, we mentioned also in the preparation talk of, you know, what does it mean to work without witnesses anymore? You mentioned also uh, developing compassion and empathy, right? And thinking about the other. And I can tell you that uh, the, from the educational perspective in Israel, so the working with witnesses is all, all, it was all around, especially when I was a child, when I was an adolescent, we had witnesses all the time. Mm -hmm. it, it was about hearing the story uh, firsthand, right, from the, from, the, from the survivor himself or herself that, that immediately connects the person or, or develops that compassion. How do you develop compassion without the witness himself or herself? And when they, there is also a generational gap. You talked about teachers and students, mm -hmm. And uh, I, we are starting to talk about the challenges of education in Germany today in the memorial site. How do you ever get this? Mm -hmm. You ask a lot of questions at once. <laughs> um, maybe uh, you started with the uh, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which is overcoming the past. It's a, it's a term that is used in Germany a lot, but it means many different things. Uh, I think it's not a sign, it's not so much a uh, um, uh, scientific term or a, a research term, it's more of a, a, a collecting term of all kinds of things that can be um, the judicial system, how much we uh, put uh, perpetrators on trial. It can be questions of culturally dealing with it in literature, in theater, and so on and so on. It can be the question of how much families discuss this in, inside their own families and how, what you just mentioned. Uh, and uh, it, it is also the question of uh, what lessons we learned out of it and up to what degree, for example, our political system develops mechanisms to prevent things to happen again. Now, uh, I would say that uh, the preconditions that uh, made something like Auschwitz possible um, uh, are still there. It happened and it can happen again. It doesn't mean that the same thing will happen in the same way, but uh, 
uh, but uh, humanity hasn't changed. We have developed uh, mechanisms of, for example, the human rights discourse uh, is helping us to, uh, to uh, get uh, capable of some things, but still we have uh, massive human rights violations in the world. We have people uh, who are discriminated for racist reasons. We have people who are uh, uh, discriminated uh, because of anti-Semitism, also in Germany, and we have to uh, still face that. And we have right-wing movements um, that adopt themselves to a changing historical narrative. So, for can you, example, can you elaborate about this? Really, what does it mean right? to work in the edge, edge of 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 the entry of political right-wing extremism in the mainstream yes. in Germany? How is it being? How how do you how much do you feel this in the site itself with with groups today? Right-wing mm -hmm. extremist thinking, for example. Um, there has been a discussion in the past year in Germany, whether, or in the past months, you can say, whether um, there is more uh, difficult cases of groups inside the memorials. I personally think that we don't have more incidents with right wing, um, but we are more aware of it. Um, we are more aware of it in, the, in so far as that maybe um, our guides tell us more what they heard and what happened because there is actually, because of the rise of the new right, there is a, a larger discussion about that. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the difficult thing is um, that uh, the new right is not um, just a more conservative conservatism. It is a reform of the, uh, of the, um, of the national socialist ideology with different terms. And, uh, and they're trying to uh, change their way. For example, the old right would use the symbols of the Nazis. The new right distance itself from the Nazis. So they whitewash their ideology uh, in, in other terms. Uh, and that means uh, they would say, they would distance themselves from National Socialism. They would also come to the memorials and maybe say how terrible that was with the Jews. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, and in the next sentence, they would say, and now we are the Jews of today being persecuted. So they're twisting history. It's not, uh, it's not a, uh, a, a negation of history. Um, it's not Holocaust denial. It is distortion. It's what the IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, has as their program these years that they face uh, distortion rather than um, uh, denial. So, uh, so they're interpreting the history for their own purposes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I had myself, I had a group of, uh, uh, of people who were invited by, um, by the AFD party to the memorial and they... Um, can you tell uh, us, can you tell us about that day and what happened in the memorial? Yeah, when we went to the, the group, the group was pretty okay. They didn't, uh, um, they didn't ask provocative questions and, and there was, you know, there was even empathy for the victims among some of them. And then I heard at a, at a side talk that they were talking in front of a picture of anti-Semitic uh, 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 signs that were put up in a village in Germany. That they were saying, ah, now and this is what is happening today uh, to uh, to the AfD. You know, and uh, and uh, they the victimization. They are they are the, the self victimization. Discourse yes. All the time yes. The yes. They don't that. It is difficult, you know, because it's a it's a range of people. It's it's there's the, there's the the party members and the and the elites that are trying to whitewash national socialism in a new way. I had a, a, a case with a, um, a group from the um, from Alice Weidel um, uh, who went to the memorial and they uh, and they tried to uh, indeed provoke uh, uh, our guide um, who who was with the group. Uh, in the terms that they um, denied uh, the, the existence of gas chambers or put it in question in front of the guide. And this happened several times. But this was one, maybe two people out of the group. One of them was uh, sentenced. So uh, he had a court case afterwards and he was sentenced for for the Holocaust denial. I think you were mentioning before uh, that uh, there is a kind of dual, a dual discourse. On the one hand, they are indeed right-wing extremists and uh, there are many anti-Semites also in this party. And on the other hand, they are proclaiming themselves to be the best friends of Israel or best friends mm -hmm. of the Jewish community. How do you, 
how do you manage this? How do you explain this uh, when, mm. when you come across these kind of groups in, in the memorial? Yeah, that's a very interesting point because I, I think it shows uh, one of the contradictions that there are with this party. Um, many of the new right uh, go around with Israel flags. Uh, but uh, they're not doing that uh, out of um, any sympathy for, for Jews or for Israel indeed, but, but they're trying to present themselves as protectors of the Jews, which uh, cleans them sort of from the past. So they are not, uh, they don't, they, they uh, publicly distance themselves from the Nazi past and the Holocaust persecution of Jewish people. That's one aim. The other aim is, um, because uh, because uh, uh, there is a, a widespread uh, belief that anti-Semitism is a problem of Muslim people, which is not right. I can say more about that, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's not the point here. They're trying to uh, address uh, anti-Muslim racism by presenting themselves as protectors of the Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a false... Uh, solidarity because it doesn't care about the Jews actually and if you look at the party um, they are quite anti-semitic you have a lot of uh, conspiracy theories in that party um, for example there is a term that's called uh, Bevölkerungsaustausch exchange of population um, this is something that they claim is happening uh, inside Germany um, so they they say that there is a secret plan to bring uh, Muslims to Germany and exchange the population. Behind that is the belief of a homogeneous body of the people. And this, uh, this picture of a body of the, the Volk, the German Volk as a, as a body, is, is part of the Nazi ideology. So yeah, exactly. um, it's not a concept of citizenship in a liberal society where um, the citizens are those living there and being born there. This is, I, I really thank you for, for saying this because I, I, I would like to emphasize more on this point, point also for our viewers and for our listeners. What does it really mean perpetrator language? Because you say uh, uh, it's a very sophisticated way what they're doing. It's like you say they don't mention the word race. Like they know what is allowed and what is not allowed, mm. right? The rule of this, the rules of the discourse. What, what uh, is allowed and what is not allowed to say and they play with it all the time. You know, there, there is a, of course, you know it that there is a whole field, research field, on, that deals with perpetrator language. First of all, the victimization of the self. If if they proclaim themselves to the, to be the victims, then the real victims are vanished from the discourse. Yeah, mm -hmm. what is the perfect crime? The perfect crime is not always um, the crime itself or the the uh, 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 you know how to commit the crime itself. It's all, it's also if mm. what is being discussed afterwards, once the victim is being erased from the discussion itself, from the discourse itself, and there's only the perpetrator, and the perpetrator itself proclaims to be, says that he is the victim, then this is so-called the perfect crime, where a crime where there is no victim. And we see it in the language, also the use of Nazi terminology. And these people know that they are using Nazi terminology today in Germany in 2020, okay? That they are using terms that, are, that, are, that were used by Goebbels, but by Himmler, by Hitler, and without, and maybe this is the difference, you can say about this a lot, and that they are doing this today without any apologies. The, 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 the time of apology has ended, right? They are saying all the time that their mouths were shut, that no, in the name of politically correctness, no one lets them speak, no one lets them, free, in the name of freedom of speech, right? No one lets them speak out loud and they live in democracy and the way they interpret democracy is that they have freedom of speech. Freedom of speech for them means also to use Nazi terminology for the use of today, for, 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 you know, against minorities living in Germany today, Muslim minorities, you know, Jews as well, but Jews are not the only minority living in Germany, right? We're talking about many others. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I can think about people like Bjorn Höcke or Alexander Gauland. Um, Bjorn Höcke from the, from the AFD talked about a change of 180 degrees in understanding history. And this is a person who was a history teacher. This is a person who worked for 15 years uh, uh, teaching students in Germany history. Mm -hmm. 
and he is calling the the document the the, the um, monument of course the holocaust monument in berlin a monument of shame alexander gaulan said just two years ago that it is time that germany will be proud of the achievements of not only the first world soldiers but also of the second world war german mm -hmm. soldiers mm -hmm. these are people who talk today without apologizing for what they're mm -hmm. saying they don't think that there's a, any reason to apologize and they are not mm -hmm. only one or two people i wish that we would deal only with one or two people they're talking in the name of many of crowds mm -hmm. and some of them are coming to your m memorial and you have to deal mm -hmm. with it so can you say maybe a bit more about the language itself, how, how you feel? Also in the dis the public discourse, has, has language changed in your eyes? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you've given some of the best examples of, uh, how, uh, of what is happening there. For example, what Alexander Gauland said about uh, the, the, the soldiers, you know, um, uh, that is trying to change the discourse. We have uh, a discourse, we have, you know, in the, the, there was an exhibition out about the German army in the middle of the 90s and, and another one uh, in 2001, uh, which uh, showed the crimes of the Wehrmacht. Now, these crimes, um, that, was, that was strongly discussed, you know, in, in, a, time for, uh, in a time 50, uh, 55 years after the war. Um, people were fighting about it in, in Germany. There were lots of discussion. There was even an arson attack on one of the exhibition points in 95. Um, so this was a, a, a hot topic in Germany. Now, um, I think that most of the population has accepted the fact that the Wehrmacht soldiers were taking part in the crimes. And I think it is still this way today. I think that most people wouldn't deny that. We had a change from uh, the, the, the Cold War uh, Germany's to the Berlin Republic. And now we have a backslash. We have a, a, a group of right-wing people who are saying, okay, it happened. Uh, and at the same time, they're like, but we can still, now we can still be proud of our German soldiers. So this is kind of denying this history in the same sentence. But what the right-wing, sorry? The qu when you say that you raise questions uh, yeah. with them, with, with soldiers in Germany today, what kind of questions do you pose to them? Uh, how are we working um, with, uh, you said with army groups, for example, Bundeswehr, the German <laughs> army, if they're coming to the uh, memorial, um, for example, we will, uh, uh, the, most of the groups come for, for a guided tour and then we will do what we do with any group. But if they would book a seminar um, with us, we would, uh, uh, we would address uh, aspects of uh, German army history connected to our place to the memorial. So, for example, there were the Soviet soldiers uh, that were um, uh, prisoners of war, and uh, and and even at that time there was a uh, there were rights that prisoners of war had, and they were uh, neglected. And these soldiers were brought by the German army to to the Sachsenhausen um, concentration camp and shot there to death. It is an aspect that is uh, rarely talked about uh, because we usually we talk more about the Holocaust, we talk about the persecution of the Jewish people, and there is something to talk about there concerning the Wehrmacht as well. Another question that comes up then is, what could the soldiers do? And many times in, in Germany people say, yes, but if you wouldn't participate, you would be shot. You know, so, so this is an interesting question, and, and this is asked by soldiers. They want to know. They want to know uh, what would happen to someone who wouldn't go along with the Nazi politics. So, so there is uh, different levels to answer that. One level is up to what degree the soldiers had the ideology of the Nazis and would believe the same thing, and maybe they would, uh, would go along with it without asking questions, some of them. Uh, and others, uh, uh, there were cases of soldiers who did not participate and none of them was ever shot. So people who would not participate in, in, uh, in mass murders, um, soldiers, uh, they would not be uh, put on trial for them. Maybe they were put in, in another unit and maybe that could be a reason for someone to say, I wouldn't, but uh, there was no one uh, being put on the uh, shooting 
uh, because he refused to participate in it. This is a very, and very crucial and important point what you are saying here, and I really thank you for this. I, I, I also, uh, you know, from my experience also in Yad Vashem and, and uh, in my time living in Germany and dealing a lot with political education, this is exactly um, the spirit that I also received from groups that they were sure, they were, it was clear for them that these people did not have a choice. Mm -hmm. A moment yeah. before, before he pulled the trigger, when I was asking, you know, my, my the, the students, what just to, just let's just let's focus on 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 free choice. Did he have a free choice? Could he have said no? And in this case, if he would have said no, what would have happened to him? And I can tell you that 99% of all the people that I met uh, um, in 15 years of political education. The, the answer was, of course, he did not have a choice. He would have been shot. And I think, Martin, this is the, maybe the most, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that educa political educators have to face nowadays, that also the younger generations, the third and the fourth generations, truly believe this. Mm -hmm. And with this, this will be my conclusion question for you because we are very really approaching our the end of this fascinating uh, program and very important pro program of the podcast. How uh, how do political education educators and you as the head of the political of the education department of Sachsenhausen? How do you affect? Uh, their way, the, the, their, their perception or the, the, the way of their thinking afterwards when they leave Sachsenhausen and step on the bus and go, go back to their world. If it's a soldier, if it's a school uh, pupil, if it's a teacher, if it's uh, someone's grandparent. How to make it more clear to them that people did have a free choice. And uh, maybe this is the message also, you know, uh, of this program that, uh, where is free choice and and also under dictatorship and also on the on, on the edge of becoming a, a dictatorship people have a choice of becoming the opposite they have a choice of of either looking away or being the bystander and you were mm. mentioning the people of oranienburg mm. living very very close to the concentration camp and doing nothing about it and seeing it every day uh, and they have a choice to participate and to and to and and to continue and, and to mm -hmm. participate in the crimes. What is the message that you would like them to go out from this memorial? Uh, I don't think there is one message. I, I mean, if you want to send two word message, it's never again, but what never again, what, you know, and, and that is something they have to learn to fill. So I don't believe in, in this one message that people have to take. If I want them to be democratic, they have to learn it in a democratic way. And if they come for two hours, I cannot indoctrinate them with democracy. They can draw conclusions by themselves. So maybe what I have to do is I have to find a way of, that is open for discussion, democratic uh, and so on uh, for them to discuss and to raise their questions and to be taken serious with their questions. If they have a question about the population around the concentration camp, we have to talk about how many of the people around there were themselves in the SS and working for the camp. So the camp was not put in the center of Berlin so that everybody would see it. It was put on the outside near to an S-Bahn station in a forest. They built neighborhood around it where they, around the camp itself, were mainly SS people living that were being built houses there. They profited also from, uh, from the Nazi politics. Um, and there were also citizens in the, in the, in the near and, and, and the, and the uh, prisoners would go out. There were 200 concentration camp subcamps of Sax uh, uh, 100 uh, subcamps of Sachsenhausen, um, 30 of them in, inside Berlin. So you could find uh, prisoners uh, inside Germany, but not in 1933. In 1933, it was a democracy and the Nazi party was the strongest party and uh, other, other non-democratic parties gave the Nazis the power and, uh, and they uh, enlarged their power during time. They didn't start with mass murder in the first day. And, uh, and maybe that is, that is, this is one of the things they have to learn, to differentiate and to ask questions and to see uh, the perspective of different people and, uh, and to uh, learn that uh, some of the ideology uh, may be called different today, but it's still there, and that, uh, that uh, a democracy can end itself from inside a democracy. Yes, I, right. I, 
you know, I, first of all, I thank you very, very much for sharing your views with us and with our listeners and with our viewers. And I, uh, it was a true privilege for me to host you in this, in this special program for, <laughs> for Holocaust Remembrance Day. And uh, I know I definitely, I myself will take a lot from this, from this talk. And I believe others, many others will also uh, do this. I choose to end this talk okay. like I started our talk with Kolchak with Janusz Kolczak, and I, I, I finish with him and, uh, and um, with these words. Children are not the people of tomorrow, but the people of today. They are entitled to be taken seriously. They should be allowed to grow into whoever they were meant to be. The unknown person inside each of them is the hope for the future. Janusz Kolczak, uh, was murdered in 1942, and we remember him today and the six million others who were murdered, women, men, and children. Um, but their words stay with us, and they will forever stay with us. And with this, I thank you very much, Martin Schellenberg, for joining us, and wish all the best for you. And thank you to our viewers and to our listeners all over the world for joining us on the uh, Holocaust memory remembrance day here in israel thank you and goodbye thank you for inviting me to that bye i am very honored and privileged to have with us in our talk uh, a colleague from hungary dr petra baud hello petra and thank you very much for joining us today in this special program i uh, would like first of all to introduce you to our viewers and our listeners all over, all around the world uh, and then uh, and then i will i will also introduce our subject for today so first of all dr petra baud is associate professor at the department of criminal at Utvosh Laurent University of Budapest. She is also a visiting professor at the Central European University's Legal Studies Department in Budapest and in Vienna, and lectures at other universities across Europe, including Belgrade, Frankfurt, and Vienna. She participates in numerous international research consortia, such as Reconnect, a Horizon 2020 project on reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and rule of law. And she's also a principal investigator of a research team targeting hate crimes at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. In her research, Petra targets issues at the intersection of rule of law, human rights, EU criminal cooperation, mutual recognition, and mutual trust. Petra, thank you again very much for joining us today at this very special day. Thank you. Um, so uh, before we begin, uh, Petra, our talk, I, I, I'd really like, you, first of all, you know, to uh, connect us also to, this, to the special meaning of, of the Day of Remembrance of the Holocaust in Israel. And uh, I would start, uh, I would start maybe with telling you about uh, about uh, and, and our viewers and, and uh, listeners of a lecture, a very actually very important book written by, and I'm sure that you've heard about it by Daniel Ziblatt and Stephen Levitsky, of how which is called How Democracies Die. Uh, how Democracies Die, a very important book that was published in 2018. Um, by these two uh, authors, and I think these, uh, this book has a very special meaning also in terms of, of perception of memory of Holocaust and crimes of national socialism, because also there uh, a democracy fell. And uh, we're trying to understand what happened back then, 80 years ago, more than 80 years ago, in order to understand also processes that are taking place in societies nowadays, in societies in Europe. And we're going to talk about uh, the special Hungarian case also with you today. So Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt actually say that democracies fall through elections, mm -hmm. um, not anymore by military occupation. People fail to understand, they say, in real time, what they know that they no longer live in democracy. And when they do finally realize it, it's too late. The only way, they say, to prevent this from happening, that democracy will, will fail to exist, is actually not to let the demagogues or the extremists gain power. And how do these extremists and demagogues gain power back then and also today through coalitions? It's the political parties who help the extremists and the demagogues 
of back then and also of today gain power by creating coalitions with them. And I think, I know I, I decided to start um, our talk, Petra, uh, today with this, because I think um, it, is, it is taking place in Europe today. We are, live in the edge of populism uh, today. And I, I would like to take this background, you know, with, and start with a kickoff question for you. Also in the framework of Holocaust memory, when we look at Hungary today, uh, and you can give us an inside look from Hungary. How is the memory of the Holocaust, how is the memory formed in Hungary today under the Orban regime? How, what would you say, how do people learn about the Holocaust or about what happened to Jews and what happened to Europe today in Hungary? Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. It's really a privilege to be here and thank you for the very kind introduction to you. Um, and I very much share your initial thoughts and your concerns about creating coalitions. And I think that bystanders in general have a huge responsibility, whether you think in terms of political parties who tolerate uh, these heinous talks, but also in society in general, those people who never speak up for others. And I think this is one of the tragedy of Hungarian society, uh, the, the lack of civil society, the lack of standing up uh, for each other. The initial dismantling of the rule of law was very abstract in Hungary back in 2010. A uh, few people understood what it really meant depriving the Hungarian constitutional court from its powers, so they didn't stand up. But when it was the Roma, they didn't stand up. When it was those who left the country, who criticized the government, they never stood up. And interestingly, now the government has targeted each and every segment of society, and there is no one, re there's no one who remained who dares to speak up. But I think this complicity, if I may put it this way, uh, is also present um, at the level of the European Union because the European Union itself is supposed to be a community of values. It's a community of laws and it's supposed to be a community of the rule of law. Uh, Article two of the Treaty on the European Union, which is the quasi-constitution of the European Union, lists the main values that European integration is founded on. And there is a lo longish list of these values, but there are three values that stand out, and these are the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. Now, these foundational values are violated in a number of member states. There is no a state that is totally immune to deficiencies with regard to the rule of law or democracy or fundamental rights. But there are some member states now in the EU which systematically um, violate and diminish these values. Now, interestingly, everything that they do, I mean the autocrats, they have a so-called veneer of legality it seems to be legal. And I know there are many historical connotations and parallels that we can exactly. draw. My question so is exactly directed to this. How, do you, how can we see similarities that happened in the past that are actually taking place also nowadays? And afterwards, if you connect it also to how is it, being, how is it affecting education of Holocaust memory, then I'm sure Absolutely. it has also effects on this. Yes, but, uh, yes I, I will come back to, to the education part too. Just let me, let, me, let me just emphasize that they even curb constitutional law mm -hmm. in order to serve their own purposes, which is interesting because constitutional law in general is about taming power. It's about separation of powers, it's about checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And now everything in Hungary at least is squeezed into the constitution that is contrary to democracy, the rule of law, and fundamental rights. So this is what my colleagues call constitutional vandalism or legal hooliganism or constitutional barbarism even. And what we see is that uh, the EU does very little to overcome or to stop these phenomena. And what is more, it even contributes to this. So this very much mirrors your early, earlier point, the EU, gives huge funding 
to the, mem the problematic member states, including Hungary. Um, the vast majority of this money doesn't reach the people, it reaches the oligarchs that are connected to the government, and also it gives political shield uh, for the governments that are actually acting in violation of EU values. Now, as I said, everything has a veneer of legality and it's very difficult to trace, to pinpoint the problematic aspects of laws and policies of the government. If you look at Holocaust uh, remembrance, you will see that even though there, everything uh, is about the, uh, the fight against the epidemic nowadays, Prime Minister Viktor Orban uh, took the time and at least posted a photo on social media about the Stolperstein, the stumbling stone of P. Howard or Reiter Jenner, um, who, um, who, who died uh, in the Holocaust. And he also uh, made this one sentence saying that um, Memorial Day of the Hungarian victims of the Holocaust is important. Uh, we are honoring the memory of P. Howard and the hundreds of thousands who never made it back. So uh, if you look at the criminal code, you will see specific hate crime provisions in the Hungarian criminal code that do uh, go after crimes uh, committed out of an anti-Semitic bias. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, education, you will learn that, of course, Hungarian students do learn about the Holocaust. But if you go beyond the letter of the law, if you go beyond uh, these, these uh, textual analyses of the law, you will see that, first of all, the legal provisions are not applied especially hate speech provisions are not meaningful in Hungary. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the criminal law statistics, there are virtually no hate speech cases. If you look at the hate crime statistics, the numbers of hate crimes is so low that according to the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, Hungary is among the member states which do not provide data to the EU. This is not true. We do provide data, but the data is so little that the Fundamental Rights Agency doesn't believe that there is such a little number of hate crime victims and victims of anti-Semitism um, in Hungary. Also, if you look at literature books, for example, in Hungary, um, there is a whole identity politics developed through education, among other factors. For example, among the 10 most important Hungarian authors, you have Ferenc Herceg, who was an ardent support of the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. You have other anti-Semitic authors constantly cited in the political speech. And interestingly, the books, uh, the school books, contain no mention of Hungary's only Nobel-winning author, Imre Kertész, who was honored back in 2002 for his body of work on the human experience during the Holocaust. So you really have to dig deep into practice, uh, into case law, into, uh, into the everyday lives of Hungarian citizens in order to understand the underlying uh, subtle anti-Semitism that is out there. How, what is the Hungarian narrative of today? If you can elaborate a bit on this. Mm -hmm. Now the edge of it has been taken away very much in education. Uh, so, the, so the message conveyed to the citizens and also uh, to the young citizens, students, mm -hmm. is that the prime responsibility lies with Nazi Germany. And Hungary, Hungarian politicians, they tried to fight, but it's a small country. We didn't really have a choice. So it's big Germany versus small Hungary, which was exposed to the facts uh, and, and to the historical facts that occurred um, right before um, the Second World War and during the Second World War, um, which is a clear distortion of facts. Um, Hungarians were very much eager to contribute to the Holocaust, according to some historians. Um, some of the Hungarian authorities and individuals were so eager uh, to have Jews sent to concentration camps that they couldn't even comply with the requests and they didn't know what to do suddenly with the large, huge amount of people uh, who, um, who were actually sent uh, to their death.
um, by the Hungarian authorities. And all these cruelties, they even, according to historians, uh, they even surprised uh, the Nazis, the German Nazis. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I do believe that you can only work on, uh, on, on such issues and, um, and, and prevent uh, further happenings um, of, um, of these heinous attacks. Uh, against certain minorities if you really face your own responsibility. Is Hungary paving its path to dictatorship? I'd, I'd like to ask you, propose you, to pose you this question and really talk about the role of civil society today in Hungary. Let's talk a little bit about the situation today and the role of fear, the role of fear and the reduction of, of, civil, of, of, uh, of freedoms in Hungary today. Mm. How, how would you describe the situation today, Petra? Back in 2010, some political scientists and some, uh, some lawyer colleagues, they already suspected this coming, looking at the first Orban government, which was in power between 1998 and 2002. Uh, but it really happened back in 2010, when in a free and fair ballot, Fidesz got... Um, 53% of the votes, which translated, according to the election laws, into a two-third majority in parliament. Yes. So, interestingly, uh, constitution making was absolutely not on the agenda bef during the election campaign. But one of the first things that the Orban government uh, uh, um, said uh, to do in the future was drafting a new constitution. Mm -hmm. And this eventually happened. It happened uh, among the strong opposition of the opposition parties, of scholars who cared, of NGOs, um, and at the ignorance of the, of the vast majority of the people. So, nevertheless, in a very I want to ask you, is it really, was it really ignorance when you say ignorance of vast majority? I'm really asking myself when the vast majority looks at what is happening and they see that Hungary is changing in front of their eyes and say what? It was not clear, it was not clear I think, to, the, to most people in, back, to, back in 2010. And constitution making during the previous governments was on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So, it wasn't entirely novel thought. It's only that Fidesz never propagated it. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the opposition party, so the social liberal coalition, it inserted a provision into the laws according to which they will only amend the constitution by a four-fifth majority in order to have a society-wide agreement uh, on the new text of the new constitution. Um, and we already made some parallels with the historical past. Um, even though everything has a veneer of legality, laws are always violated. Mm -hmm. So in this particular instance, Fidesz didn't have a four-fifth majority to draft a new constitution, but it had a two-third majority to amend the constitution. So one of the first steps they did was to get rid of the four-fifth requirement by a two-third majority. Mm -hmm. It's technically doable, but from a democratic legitimacy point of view, extremely, extremely problematic. Yes. So you asked me earlier when I, uh, what, what point in time I can, I can point to when I realized that something was fundamentally wrong. And this was the time when, uh, when the constitution was adopted without really the support of the people. Um, Fidesz tried to create this air of a constitutional moment, which has never been there. Um, they never uh, put uh, the issue of a constitution making and the text of the constitution in the referendum out of fear that it would fail. Instead, they sent a, a number of questions in the form of a letter to the Hungarian citizens uh, and they were supposed to send this letter back. Um, altogether 11% of the voters sent it back, which is way below the threshold for a referendum. And interestingly, Fidesz didn't even wait for the letters to arrive back, but instead it promulgated the new constitution, mm -hmm. uh, doing away with opposition and scholars and NGOs and, and, and everyone. 
And already there you could see that the constitution is about dismantling separation of powers, not strengthening it, and to um, um, introduce a very nationalistic um, rhetoric, uh, creating an allegedly homogeneous Hungarian nation. Uh, Which is also on, a white Christian, right? According to the basically white the Christian building, building on already existing uh, minorities uh, and and hostility against minorities, such as hostility against uh, the Roma, a hostility against suspects or convicts or the LGBTI community. Which is but also really relevant to the last uh, to to the Corona crisis, right? That just you know uh, came came to us a few months ago. That they are uh, uh, maybe maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this the, the new law that Orban passed that the government just passed against LGBT. Uh, now the enabling law it enables um, um, the the government basically to rule by decree uh, for an undefined period of time. So it's up to the parliament to, to say when the emergency situation, or as we say, the state of danger should come to an end. But since Fidesz has a two-third majority in parliament, uh, it is highly unlikely that they could put a hold to this emergency situation. And this wouldn't be unprecedented. Just remember um, that each and every crisis uh, by Fidesz is used and abused. So for example, uh, the financial crisis was abused um, for, for drafting a new, very controversial constitution. Yeah. So this, this was pinpointed as the reason for having to, uh, to draft a new constitution. Or think about the migration crisis, if it is a crisis at yeah. all. Uh, but, uh, but when the migration crisis happened, uh, Fidesz said that uh, Fidesz declared a state of emergency, which was prolonged again and again up to this date. Now, there are certain numbers uh, foreseen in the law. Uh, so if there are, I don't know, 500 uh, refugees coming per day or 800 per, uh, per week and so on and so forth, then the emergency can be prolonged. Uh, now, currently, basically no uh, asylum seeker or virtually no asylum seeker can cross the borders. An average Hungarian citizen never saw a refugee person in real life. Nevertheless, the emergency is extended. So and there is not because of the COVID-19 crisis, the, the borders are anyway closed. This is actually what exactly. he just wanted from the beginning on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we are fighting invisible and non-existing enemies. Now we are finding another existing but not visible enemy, and this is COVID-19. Yes. And there is this suspicion that again this crisis is used and abused. It's a, this this is used as a pretext for another power grab by the government. Now, as I said, um, it allows for rule by decree, by governmental decree, for an unlimited period of time. So there is no sunset clause in the law. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows to depart from the laws from the Hungarian laws that are existent. It allows to pass new laws without limitations. Um, there can be no interim elections um, held. There can be no referenda held. And there are substantial changes introduced to the criminal code um, in order to go after people um, who are reporting um, about the facts uh, of, of COVID-19 or any other pandemic or those who are not complying with the governmental decrees that were adopted uh, during this period of time. Now, interestingly, the government claims that everything that they, uh, every law that they pass in this period is temporary and it only applies as long as the pandemic is there. But for example, the changes to the constitutional code are supposed to be permanent. But not only that, there are a number of, uh, of government steps that really question uh, the true motives behind adopting this enabling law. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one of, one of the first steps the government took was to grant some real estate uh, to people who are drafting and redrafting Hungarian history in line with identity politics. 
um, that are close to Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Another first measure was depriving people who are um, transgender uh, from their right to have their new gender registered in their identification documents. Yes. I myself cannot see how this is related to, fi uh, to fighting the epidemics. Of course, and you're not the only one who cannot see it, of course. Uh, uh, you know, Petra, this is done, uh, thank you for this uh, information, this is done under the eye of the European Union at the center of, at the central, uh, in Central Euro Europe today. I mean, this yes. Hungary is still a, 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 a member state in the European Union. Done under under the watch of the EU, and I, I will I will ask you now as a, as really approaching our unfortunately approaching the final uh, part of our discussion, fascinating discussion, an alarming one. How can this be really the situation in Europe in 2020, uh, being a member state in the EU, and what can be done about it? What can be done now from the legal perspective and your expertise? Where is, where is the EU and Hungary headed? What do you think? Uh, there are very persuasive arguments behind the laws and policies that Fidesz adopts. Uh, for example, um, they invoke national sovereignty. They invoke national security. So the law against NGOs or the law um, against uh, certain foreign universities was adopted under the pretext of national security. Mm. Also, there are some international disinformation campaigns, or in other words, lying. So when the very oh, oh, by the way, I have to insert just for a moment uh, using the anti Soros campaign, uh, which yes. is a very anti Semitic campaign against George Soros as part of this, uh, this uh, narrative, this discourse now. Absolutely, you are, you are very correct. Uh, but sometimes they just send the wrong translations of the controversial laws to Brussels. And then it's the NGOs who interfere and say, no, this is a very Europe-friendly translation of the law. Here is the real translation of the law. So it's just simple lying. Or they misuse EU legal references, or they point to international examples. Of course, uh, this is not just any international example, but they look at the most right infringing international examples that are out there. And in the end, the Hungarian solution is a, is a selection of worst practices, or as the literature says, a Franken state uh, is in the making. Now, what I argue that this is a common European Union matter. It's not only that Hungarians in Hungary will be harmed by rule of law backsliding and fundamental rights violations, but anyone who is living on the territory of Hungary with, of, of any, any citizenship. But what is more, it really delegitimizes the whole lawmaking process at the European Union level. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is Article 7, which is said to be uh, the nuclear option, I, I very much detest this denomination. Mm -hmm. um, now, Article uh, 7.2 and 7.3 is about the determination that there are systemic issues with regard to uh, EU values in a member state and uh, member states can be sanctioned. However, uh, for Article 7.2 and 3 uh, to be uh, triggered, uh, and to, for it to come to an end, uh, you need unanimity of the member states. It is very difficult to be achieved, especially because Poland also indicated its wish to shield Hungary in case um, uh, there is such a procedure initiated against Hungary and vice versa. Yeah. Now there's Article 7, Paragraph 1 procedure, which is basically a dialogue between EU institutions and the member state concerned about the situation on the ground it doesn't have a response prong. So it's nothing but a, but a dialogue. There are also many uh, procedures to monitor, to benchmark, uh, to, uh, to, to give a health check of the member states. Um, but again, uh, these procedures are without sanctions. So I would also uh, put an emphasis now on the judiciary, on the dialogue between the judiciaries. Um, and also the Court of Justice of the European Union in so-called infringement procedures. Uh, the Court of Justice can determine when a member state grossly violated 
um, European Union law, and it can also impose financial sanctions. My suggestion is also to accelerate such procedures mm -hmm. and to have interim reliefs because if there is one lesson that we learn from the Hungarian experience in the 10 past years is that time is on the side of those who dismantle the rule of law. Time is on the side of authoritarians. So if you want to do anything, you have to act promptly because later will be too late. Dr. Petra Baud, I think with this sentence, time is on the, uh, on the side of the authoritarians, on the, on the side of the extremists. I think uh, it's a very alarming sentence. And with this sentence, we will conclude this very, very important and uh, alarming discussion on the situation of Hungary today in the middle of Europe. Uh, and with this emergency situation and on the day of the remembrance of the Holocaust in Israel, how these two subjects somehow uh, in, intercross um, on a very alarming, alarming way. I wish to thank you very, very much for this important insight and for giving us the time uh, from really sharing with us your expertise and experience uh, from the inside look, giving us an inside look from the Hungarian society of today. And I wish uh, for everything you suggested that it will come true and that uh, maybe we should wish for time to be on the side of the Democrats and the liberals uh, from now on. Dr. Petro Baud, thank you very, very much. And health, of course, to all of us under this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Thank you.